Welcome everyone to ToroNet. I'm gonna to share my screen and we will get started. Okay, and if you see um, David come in, Mohammed, then you go ahead and just let him in. All right, so I worked on something last night and here it is. All right, so not saying that that logo is going to be the logo or anything, but I did work on it and um, the yellow is for Labo Labs and the blue is for ToroNet and how it's like three different colors like mixed in together is kind of representing diversity. So that's where I kind of took it, but we might have a different logo later on but I thought it would be a fun idea to make a video or an intro for ToroNet. All right, so we are a virtual platform that democratizes career resources in tech for college students. Our mission is to promote diversity in tech by providing resources, education, and coaching to diverse communities. And we do this by providing a consistent virtual platform for tech leaders and professionals to educate our attendees remotely nationwide. Every Friday, we meet at 12 noon Central Standard Time to learn from speakers, ask questions, and share career opportunities. So that is who we are. So we're all about diversity in tech. And ToroNet partners with educational institutions and nonprofits to lower barriers of access to opportunities and education for non-technical and technical careers in the tech industry. We are sponsored, uh, sponsored by Laveau Labs, which is a marketing agency, my marketing agency in Dallas, and also sponsored by Advancing the Seed, which is a nonprofit organization for uh, 18 to 25 year olds seeking work development training um, in La Habra, California. So we're always looking for speakers. If you'd like to recommend a speaker, you can send them to this link and they can fill out a form to become a speaker for us. And just so you know, speakers speak for about 10 minutes and then we have about 20 minutes Q&A. These are some of our great folks who uh, help us to make TurtleNet possible. And we are so grateful for all of the efforts that they make behind the scenes. So today uh, we have the guest speaker, uh, David Galaviz. He's running a little bit late, and uh, but we're gonna go ahead and proceed uh, and do things a little bit differently. We're going to start with opportunities and then we're gonna work our way back up. All right, so we're gonna skip that part. Okay, so here are some of the opportunities for this week. So hiring manager mixer. So if you are looking to be a hiring manager, this is a mixer going on April 22nd, uh, 6 p.m. PST San Francisco and 9 p.m. EST New York. Early bird special $35 until midnight April 13th. So if you are interested in getting the link for that, let me know and I will shoot it to you. Radiant Earth Foundation has a job alert. Are you a graduate student studying information science or social enterprise? Uh, so apply to our data policy intern position to research and identify gaps in data policies across the geospatial sector. So you can apply at that link 
And if you are interested in that opportunity, let me know and I will send you the link. So they're accepting applications for the Women in Tech Cybersecurity Educational Program for Single Mothers. That is open right now. The deadline is midnight, May 23rd, and you can apply at that link. So maybe even if you are not a single mom, but if you know of one who is interested in tech, definitely shoot them this video or send them my contact so that I can send them this link. Uh, earlier this week, we had Howie Ratliff of CompuLabs speak for us at One Million Cups. And he has an internship available as well. And that is for um, uh, web development. So if you would like more information on that, you can link with Howie on LinkedIn, or if you'd like his direct email, you can go ahead and message me and I will send you that. We have Social Hackers Academy, NGO located in Greece in collaboration with Coursera and Google to offer you a six month program in which you will become an IT support professional certified by Google. For more information about the project, please visit our website, socialhackersacademy.org forward slash women, I'm sorry for all of these, uh, women, in, <laughs> women in Greek tech, sorry, sorry. That's what happens when you're, you're an entrepreneur, you're constantly getting messages all day. Um, so this program is aimed exclusively at unemployed women living in Greece. That's interesting because, um, but uh, yeah, so that's interesting that they made it exclusively for unemployed women living in Greece. Um, I don't know if this opportunity is remote, so definitely look into it if you're interested in that. So that is an opportunity. We don't know who's watching, right? background on that. Rua is obviously a new website hosting site, and um, we will be hosting a live demonstration of how to use this incredible website. So let me get to that part. So um, we were going to have it on May 3rd, but we decided just before this meeting to actually move it up to next week. So we're gonna give a live webinar on how to build your own website, no experience necessary. And that is going to come with a free trial for Rua web hosting, website hosting. If you haven't already, check out Rua.co and um, look at the beautiful templates they have and what I recommend it for, especially for students, is using it as a resume or a personal website for uh, when you're looking to um, put yourself out there in a different way professionally and create a brand for yourself. We've talked about that on Toronet, is um, basically building your online presence and a great way to show showcase your professional side outside of social media or LinkedIn is to have your own website. You can also use it for uh, college clubs or anything else that you're doing, uh, projects, or even if you have your own business or side hustle. This is an affordable resource that is quite professional looking, easy to use, um, no code, no design experience necessary. So it's a really nice option. Okay, so we're gonna get to tech water cooler. Uh, let's see what David said. He said, uh, okay, hold on one second. He's saying he's gonna hop on soon. One second, you guys. Um, maybe Mohammed, can you read this while I message with, um, uh-oh, hold on. 
Muhammad, if you don't mind, can you read the tech water cooler while I get back with David? Yeah. Okay. Sorry, every time you um click on this, it automatically goes forward. It doesn't go backward. There we go. Okay, so tech water cooler. I am interviewing for my dream job this week. It's stressful but exciting. There is a certain amount of guilt I feel though about interviewing for a job while working for my current company. Is there a way around that guilt or any of the feelings of inadequacy I am feeling right now? Is there a way around that guilt or any of the feelings of inadequacy that I'm feeling right now? Hmm. What do you guys think about this? I'm interviewing for my dream job while working for another company. How would you guys, would you guys feel any guilt and how would you go around it? You can type in the chat or you can oh, come up with your... Sorry about that. I'm going to get it back to that page. Me personally. Yeah, definitely go ahead in the chat box and type in how you would feel. Go ahead, Mohammed. Yeah, I... Uh, I think if it's really my dream job, even if I feel a little bit of guilt, I think I would... I would, how do I get around the feelings of guilt? I'll probably, I think I'll go with the interview first. And then if I get the job or not, I don't think I'll feel too guilty. I'll probably figure out if I am qualified for that dream job and then try to decide if I really want to go for it. Because I feel like sometimes the dream jobs may not really be what, we really really want so i will probably figure that out first and then if i want to go for that job then talk to my employer and go for it yeah can you hear me mohammed yeah did you guys okay. hear me or not? yes we can hear you i okay. i didn't want to click anything because every time i touch my ipad apparently it just makes the thing go forward but um did anybody type anything in a chat box in, in the chat box yet or no uh not yet okay definitely i would love to hear about this um from you guys um have you ever had an experience where you were at a job and you were looking for a new job did you feel guilt about it at all and if so um um if so you know how did you overcome it for me no i didn't have any guilt around looking for a new job anytime I needed to because usually for me personally if I was leaving a job it was because I, I knew it was time either something was wrong at the job or um it was like some a situation like maybe I moved or something like that I've never experienced having guilt about wanting to leave a place um Usually because sometimes when you work at different places and you, you actually work there and you realize it's not the best fit for you or it wasn't what you were told it was going to be. And so in those cases, I don't feel any guilt about that. So for this person, I guess this person feels guilt because they like their job and they feel like they'll be letting someone down. But everyone has to understand that um, and everyone, even though I, I mean, I'm an employer, so I definitely know the pain of like every time I would have to lose someone, it hurts. You know, even, even if I had only had them for a little while, it hurts in some way. Um, then you have to deal with the aftermath. But as I grew in maturity to understand that 
people have to do what's best for them. And my business is just a launching pad for them to learn what they need to learn, um, provide as much value as possible so that they can go out and be their best selves and go into the next place better because they had this experience for, with me. So, um, you know, I, I think that this person was just feeling guilty because they, they didn't want to hurt their boss's feelings. And I think that's really nice and considerate, but the reality is um, no one, people, especially these days, who stays at a job like 20 years anymore? Like not this generation, like millennials and, and Gen Zers, they, they're not looking to stay in a place they hate for 20 years. Like, am I right or wrong about that? That's right. Yeah. Anybody have any um, any uh, input on that before we move to the next? All right, perfect. All right, we're gonna go to the next one. So we have some hot tech tea. I don't think this is hot tea because to me, hot tea is like, ooh, you know, is something that's like, you know, scandalous but I think this is like warm tea not even warm tea this is like mild tea okay so people are starting to wonder and I don't know let me know if you have ever wondered this are tech certifications going to make degrees less attractive in your opinion before I go to the next part where I show a video uh, come off of mute and say what your opinion is. Do you believe tech certifications will become more attractive to people than tech degrees? I can't see the chat box. What do you think, Mohammed? Or, or Flory or uh, Beatrice? I think they already, I think they already are more what did you say more attractive yeah i think they already are more attractive especially to the to the masses by the masses mm -hmm. i mean most people because right now the tech field especially the, i have a lot of friends that are going back to school just because they want to learn about this data stuff so mm -hmm. I feel like for most people, especially right now with all of the tech going on and all of this data stuff going on, more people that want to get into that will rather just do a certification, which is still very mm -hmm. valuable. And even as, a, as somebody that has a tech degree myself, I still have to do certifications to kind yes. of validate my degree. So definitely tech certifications. We'll just get the reason, the reason why I said that is because yesterday I saw something I never saw before. Yesterday I saw mm -hmm. some job posting for um, Delgado College in uh, New Orleans, where I'm from. And it was for a lead like digital, um, like IT or, or digital course, right? It was a couple of mm -hmm. positions for that remotely. And they had the teaching assistant. And when I looked at the qualifications for the teaching assistant, it was a certification in Google Analytics and Facebook Blueprint. And that's it. And I was just like floored. I was like, not in a bad way, but like, wow. So it is happening, it's happening. So let me go to this video. Google just launched an incredible certificate program intended for anyone looking for a career change. Let me show you. Google basically said, you don't need any experience and you can learn at your own pace. Here are five certificate programs to choose from. And once you're done, we're going to help you ace that interview. Oh, and also we're going to help you land the job because we've partnered with 130 employers in our exclusive platform who want to hire you. This is an amazing opportunity, so make sure to go to Grow with Google to learn more. I don't know if that was an ad or anything, but and like definitely Google is getting you know some negative attention in other departments right now. Um, we have David Galvez, uh, who's just come in. David, we were just talking about um, 
basically is 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 it changing like in the in the workforce where now certifications are more you know more the thing to look for in a great candidate and because of that is that causing students to look at more towards certifications than degrees what do you think mm -hmm. um i'm not entirely sure if maybe i'd have like the best sort of direct experience with this in order to give the most concrete answer since i really don't do a lot of hiring directly for like mm -hmm. product team, dev teams but i can say that when it comes to startups or getting into the tech space uh, what I found about really getting the job aside from having the exact skills that that they ask for, which I think, you know, there's a lot of great programs and a lot of great organizations like this one that encourage and show you a community of what you should be learning. So, but I think that's, that's mostly the gist of what a lot of founders and a lot of investors are just looking for, even from a founder who is a technical background, who is going to be a developer and may not have a certification or may have a very high degree from a university. So a lot of the times it's just like the work that can be done and help out in terms of certifications. I mean, I wrote I wrote a white paper regarding really like signaling value and adding value. There mm -hmm. are a lot of companies and firms that do use certifications that do use universities more as a sort of like signaling value, signaling virtue, such as, you know, this person was able to accomplish the certificate, whether or not they know the exact skills that they're going to need in order to help in my company or my firm. I don't know about that, but to some, it doesn't matter because they usually have like a training program. Other firms, it's different for them. They just want someone to kind of go in there, like just running, you know, hit the floor running. So I think it, it's really dependent as to what companies you're targeting mm -hmm. and what is your, what is your already background, you know, with a lot of people that have maybe a background in this, in the, like a computer science degree, they wouldn't need a certification at all whatsoever. Maybe for those mm -hmm. who have absolute no, like no background in this at all, maybe need that sort of sort of sort of certification if it's going to help them with the value added of learning actually how to code the things that they need to learn the appropriate languages, or if they just want it as a virtue signaling because even though they have the skills they've been having a troublesome time of actually getting into and getting an opportunity to get there. So they have to find something that shows them like look I did go to formal schooling I did do an institution. I'm not just saying I can I can code just based off of my own of my own word, but it's been it's been backed and it's been proven by other means. So I mean, in that sense, a certification can can really help you or it cannot. It just depends as to the person that you are, the company that you're trying to go into, and the industry that you're that you're looking to go into. Uh, but I mean, if you're asking like my opinion first, is like you know, can you do the job as an investor? I would just kind of look at to see, you know, is are, are we doing well with the startup? Is are we getting traction? Are things working? I'm not a, I'm not a thousand percent concerned about what university you graduated from, even if you graduate from university at all. I'm just more more concerned about the startup itself, the venture itself, and whether you have the chops to do it. And the chops to do it usually do not fall down to the technical skills. They usually fall down to the person, their grit and their interpersonal skills is usually what I would value a lot more as an investor. But again, um, that's why I kind of preface this. I'm a little far away from, from the actual mm -hmm. granular work that you have to do. I'm sure a project manager um, would want a little bit more of a detail, a little bit more of a background for this. Yeah, that was an excellent answer. Um, I think that that perfectly answered the question, honestly. Um, it definitely depends. And I just looked over to my right. I actually made a list. I had I just I did some research for a few months on some of the most high in demand uh, certifications coming from people who are actively working, actively job seeking, or actively hiring managers. And those were Salesforce, PHP, SQL. Java, Python, cybersecurity, blockchain, TensorFlow, React, Spring, and Django. Mm -hmm. For those of you um, who are interested in, and those are the ones that I kept hearing over and over again. But excellent answer. What we're doing, David, is we're, we're going through some of our different slides and we're gonna get back and come back to you because we wanna do a Q and A with you on um on what you were talking about when you actually 
gave your answer just now, you mentioned about investors and I want to circle back to that. Yep. So here's the question of the day. Um, who are you reading right now? Who are you reading right now? I am pulling out my Audible right now and I'm going to tell you who I'm reading. Anybody want to volunteer and say who you're reading? I personally am not reading a book, but what I do mm -hmm. enjoy reading I don't know if it sounds nerdy or sad, maybe, but I actually do enjoy reading a lot of the technical one papers and and websites and articles that a lot of the clean climate companies that we work with. I mean, I just have a huge fascination for hard sciences. You know, if it wasn't going to be an investor life, my other life might have been in organic chemistry. Um, so really I have a huge fascination for a lot of the science and understanding how a lot of the technology works. I know it's not really a book or it's a thousand percent concentrated on like what I'm doing, but I do have to understand the background of these industries and of these technologies. So whenever I am looking at these ventures, they, they make sense to me as to what is it that we're selling or what is it that we're doing to people? Um, that's kind of what I read. Yeah. That or Twitter. I love, I love that. Um, I'm the same way. I like to learn about whatever it is that I'm trying to sell um, or deal with, right? So, you know, I have this deep seated fear of being asked a question that I don't know the answer to. So I always make sure I study up. One of my, I guess, geeky um, interests is uh, neuroscience and quantum physics. Now, you would, when you look at me, you wouldn't think that I would be into that, but I'm very much into it. So what I'm reading is, I'm reading Brad Feld and Jason Mendelson of Venture Deals. Um, this book was recommended to me, and I absolutely love it. Venture Deals, if you are looking to get investments for your tech startup, it will walk you through just like the practical stuff and the essential things that you need to know. And it's so easily explained, like even a child could understand it. I'm reading Tim Ferriss, Tools of Titans. Also a very great book. If you like to hear stories about successful people and how they got started or just little known um, secrets or things about them, that's a great story for that, a book for that. And one great book that I would recommend to anyone going into marketing is Al Reese or Al Rice. I don't know how to pronounce his name. And Jack Trout, The 22 Immutable uh, Laws of marketing. Excellent, excellent practical book. Love these books and highly recommend it. Anyone else reading something that they want to share? All right, we'll go to the next one. All right, so remember next week, Mohammed and I are going to walk you through making your own website and we're going to use Rua as an example. And you can also go to rua.co and use the free trial. And so as we're walking through the website with you and how to do different things, we'll be showing you how to use different tools. And so it's going to be really great for you if you want to use that website and get started for free. OK, so that's our follow information. Um, I'm going to come back to that quote of the day, but we're going to go to talk a little bit about David Galvez, and he's going to just speak to us a little bit, and I just have to skip through. Sorry about that. All right, so who is David Galvez? Uh, he is the senior director at Social Wealth Partners with around four years of experience in the field. Correct us if we're wrong, David. Um, he has done many on, different keep, positions. Huh? Sorry, keep going. I'll, I'll, I'll do my input afterwards. Okay. He has done many different positions that involve marketing, research, and business development. David first graduated from Texas A&M University with a degree in economics with different con uh, concentrations in economic development, finance, and market innovation. As he has moved through his career, he became a part of the core teams for three different startups. Many of his experiences has taught him about the culture of corporate America 
but led him to connecting to uh, connecting with the investors community. When he's out of the office, you can find him staying active and cooking, but that doesn't restrict his passion for connecting with new entrepreneurs and fund managers who are looking to make an impact. I don't know where Taylor gets all of his information, but he went deep. Taylor, Taylor Dole, he's absolutely amazing human being. And um, he gathers all this information from all over the web. So thank you, Taylor, for that bio. And uh, David, I want you to go ahead and talk to us a little bit about you know, investors and just speak from the heart. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you very much for that bio. I think I think it really does touch on a good chunk of, of what I've done. There's there's obviously a lot more. I don't know actually how many years I've, I've been in it. I think the first startup that I was in was 2016. So yeah, I guess it's been five. And then I was a researcher starting in 2014 or 15. And then I worked in corporate America before that. So <laughs> I, I try to kind of just keep a focus on my I guess all careers relevant, but the, the focus on the topic of like re, of uh, entrepreneurship and investors, which I have been doing that I think I guess like for about four years. Um, as mentioned, my my it, it all started with me actually being at a university as a researcher, and I was just a researcher. But they had me do a lot of due diligence for a lot of startups that the university wanted to invest in. So while doing that, I I interviewed a lot of high performing founders, and I found what founders and what frameworks and practices that the top performers had in order to have successful ventures. Um, so it was really great. And while I was there, I was able to build an academia and fund accelerator ecosystem with the university that's still active right now. Um, they have it called uh, Maze Innovation Research Center, where they're doing a lot of great work. Um, so that's kind of what led me to my three companies. I mean, I interviewed one of them and I liked them so much with what they were doing. They were trying to decentralize education on a platform, worked with them until we raised their money for pre-seed. Then after that, I jumped into a team of my friend who was doing another impact startup called Jay Kassan. And they were trying to help mitigate the financial issues in the supply chain um, ecosystem in India and rural India and eventually Latin America and Southeast Asia. So with them, did the same thing. And mostly, most of my work was a lot of business dev, a lot of market research because of my researching capabilities in the past, and then actually building teams. I had a lot of people skills. So I had no issue talking to the investors if that's what we had to do. We had to raise money. Strategic partnerships became a heavy aspect of what I did, um, really kind of mitigating deals, making sure both parties had a lot of uh, mutual benefits while also still making sure that the full outcome came in the end. Um, raised for them 3.2 million from Bloom Ventures. After that, they launched to Mumbai, India. They asked me to come along, but um, I, wasn't, <laughs> I wasn't quite ready to go to Mumbai. Uh, so I stayed here in the States and they actually got me in contact with their investor. Um, so I actually worked for an angel syndicate for a while, mostly early stage startups. And I dealt with any startup, whether they were selling saffron, whether, whether they were trying to make self-driving tractors, whether they were trying to make uh, satellites um, for weather, more pinpointed weather results. Um, so really it varied a lot, like just networking. And, and I think that's kind of like the one thing I'm gonna I'm a, I'm a keep mentioning a lot, networking. It, you know, we talked about these certificates. Yeah, yeah, ask me anything, by the way. I'm just gonna tell you a little bit more about, about my background, a little bit about investing, but at any, any time, Feel free to interrupt, uh, put them in the chat box. I can read them right here and I'll answer them as I go. Um, so like I was saying, um, I'm gonna keep mentioning networking because I think to me, that's the strongest effect. That's at least what's helped me personally. I didn't always have the exact cookie cutter background that a lot of people were asking for, a lot of certificates or a lot of degrees. I just kind of had a lot of grit and then I always had someone else in my pocket thanks to networking, you know? So uh, I networked with at the Angel Syndicate where I was, and I joined another startup, the last startup I was with, Tap Goods, and they were also focused on creating a marketplace, but for rentals rather than consumerism. They were trying to reduce consumerism. Same story there, built them up. They had like five beta customers when I, when I first arrived. Uh, when I left, they had 50 large clients and then a lot of, a lot of uh, B2C clients by then, and we had a lot of monthly revenue raise money but the ceo mentioned that he wanted to do more of m a exit strategy which wasn't something i was trying to focus on my focus on venture capital not private equity 
private equity necessarily. So I jumped and I actually joined another, another venture capital firm here in Dallas, well, technically Irving, called Naya Ventures. For them, it was mostly internet of things, uh, AI, a lot of cloud deals. Um, I actually got do a lot of international deals since they were doing a lot more Indian deals. So I got to find a lot of impact works and I actually got in contact with the World Economic Forum where I started doing a lot of impact initiatives for them. Um, not all of them were investments. A lot of them were social good projects, which has actually led me to my project right now in Dallas, the Shaping Entrepreneurship, which is going to be a venture builder impact community program for um, really anyone, nonprofits, SMEs, SMBs, startups, um, or any organization that is really trying to use impact as a way to provide to the community. That's what we're trying to help them do. Um, so really, that's kind of been my journey through the whole both sides of the table, the investor side, the entrepreneurship side. Favorite investor show, Shark Tank or Elevator Pitch? I did grow up watching Shark Tank. I was a huge fan of it, you know, but when I was younger, I didn't understand exactly what, what it took to kind of get the winners. I didn't quite understand. I noticed some people were a little bit more anim animated. Other people very much knew their, knew their homework. It was a very interesting show. I can't say how much of it had affected me going the route that I was going. I took the route that I took because I just want to learn general economics and general business. And I was a little greedy uh, in that I did not want to specify myself to one industry because I always wanted to do a lot of a lot of different industries. So Shark Tank was great. I, I really liked that. Um, let's see, I think you said something about ideal ideal founder versus not ideal founder. Um, really, I think I would kind of really push back that question to say it kind of depends on the category and stage that the that this founder has their startup in. Obviously, a founder that's going to be in your Series B, you're going to want this person to be a really well-professional CEO who's dealt with M&A deals, who's dealt with IPOs. And if they're not, you would want this person to be smart enough to surround themselves by a team that has these people that have had experience and have done it before, not people that have been adjacent to, but people that have literally done it before. Um, but really, when I when I look for a, when I look for a founder, and it's really important because a founder is going to be the most important thing of the startup whatsoever, because a startup is is like just a product. There's just an idea, um, a product that only takes a couple of years until it's, you know, it's it's outdated. It no longer it no longer works. So it's really going to be important for the investor is going to be the founder. It's always going to be the founder. A lot of times teams or startups that don't work out, they work out due to the teams splitting up, not understanding well, not having aligned values. So it's important for the founder to be able to choose the team members well. It always falls on them. The biggest things that I like to see in a founder, um, if I'm going to be really high level and not be too specific are two things, capacity, capacity and readiness. I want them to have enough capacity that, you know, to be able to take what it is they're going to take because this is a long journey. It's a marathon. It's not going to be short. And there's going to be lots of steps and lots of pivots and lots of changes. So I need this person to have a lot of bandwidth. They need to be ready for it. And that's where the readiness comes in. I need this person to be able to take what me or anyone I introduced them to, take what we're giving them seriously. We understand that we're never going to be the experts. The founder is going to be the expert because they created everything. But there are some certain things that we can help them with in certain frameworks. And one of the worst things that certain founders can do is if they have that mentality of like, I know it all, even if they do come with the, with, you know, maybe their mouth is saying, I do want help. I know I don't, I don't know everything, but if their actions are speaking other ways, cool. Yeah. If you, if you want to be polite on a phone call, that's fine. I think investors have perfected that. So I try to warn people, you know, if, you, if, it, if the call is going too swimmingly, but you're not giving the investor what they want, they're probably just being polite to you so they could just wrap up this conversation close it up and talk to the next 10 people that they have for the rest of the day. Um, so if you're not listening to them and you're not really reciprocating and there's not really a back and forth and if they're just like, yep, 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 then that's probably going to be like, they're done. So really, really be open. It's a conversation, you know, um, that's what I would look for in, inter can, in terms of the founder. Can Go I ahead. say something on that, David? I just wanted to ask. Um, so one thing that I'm learning and correct me if I'm wrong, that um, the relationship between the founder and their investor, especially if they're a lead investor, is kind of like a mentorship relationship as well. So 
in that case, when someone wants to come in as an investor, are they also looking at this person as, okay, I'm going to help lead and guide them? And should that person who's the founder be aware that, okay, this person is not just giving me their money, they're, I'm inviting them into my world to be a mentor and help me to bring this to its full potential? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think... Um... So that is definitely one of the types of relationships. I think when it comes to an investor and a founder, the founder, what I'll say this is the founder is the most important person, period. Like that's it. If you want cash, there's lots of cash everywhere. We can always find another investor. We can find a bank. We can take a loan out. So the founder is always going to be really important. This is all just like, you know, if you want to work with an investor, you're going to have to listen to them. You're going to have to like play along. You have to play nice. But in terms of like how it has to go, there is no set rules. If you are a founder who needs a mentor, um, then make sure that your that your investor is that type of person, because there are investors that just kind of, you know, drop the money and they dip and that's it They're out. If you don't want the dynamic where the investors kind of like over you and if you want a more equal grounding, then make sure you you make that clarified with your investor, you know, like you guys are my investor, you guys you guys give me money and you guys get your equity and that's it. I'm still a driver. I'm still the one in charge of this and that. A lot of times it is the lead investor. So this is probably like where that focus is right now of like, what does this investor look like? This is usually for the lead investor. For the other investors, a lot of time they understand and the founder understands that they're just in it for the ride. They're giving you the money to close out the rest of the round, but it still doesn't, it still doesn't hurt to try to make sure that most of your investors can in some way help you, whether it's something mentorship whether it's something as commoditized as to give me an introduction to someone I can sell to, because that's what I need in order to grow and scale. I would always pivot it, position it, or leverage it in a way where you're getting the most out of your investor as a founder. You always, always should. Like money, the money that the investor is giving you should be bare minimum what they're giving you, uh, in my opinion. They should give you a lot, a lot more. Love that. Okay. Sure. We'll take uh, one more question in the comments and uh, whichever one you did. <laughs> All right. There's actually a couple of good ones. Worst mistake you've ever made in this sector. Um, I don't think it's going to help you guys. Someone knows nothing about investor DC. Where would they begin? That one's pretty quickly. So I'll give that one. Venture deals. Just that's the Bible, really. Um, what should be absolutely avoided when pitching to investors? Um probably i mean venture deals kind of really outlines a lot of things that you should be doing if you really go really far out of that scope you're definitely wrong i don't know if there's like one concrete thing i guess if you come in and you didn't do your homework and by homework it's like you really don't know how much your company is valued you really don't know what your company's value proposition is you really don't know anything about the investor you don't really know about anything about the what they invest in what they do in so I'd say just do your homework, at least um, with investors. I can get into a lot of details as to things that you shouldn't do. But if I'm going to try to keep this on a high level for where it applies to everyone, do your homework, you know. And if you're asking, what should I do my homework on? What's your biggest concern? Do your homework on that and do your homework on anything that implicates that. If you're, if you're coming on a call to raise money, then do your homework about what it takes to raise money. How much should I be giving someone? How much should I be taking from someone? What should I expect from them? What do they expect from me? Do I have those things that they expect from me? Because you don't want to show up empty handed. I love that. I love that. There, I mean, there's so, so much to unpack. And I just want to invite everyone. David is a great mentor. Um, and if you have any questions, you can connect with him on LinkedIn and send him any of your questions. Thank you so much, David, for um, coming on and giving us your time and wisdom. We so appreciate you. Um, and I'm going to go and share my screen just one more time to go to our quote of the day. And then we will conclude. Let's go. And on our quote for the day, we have, success is to be measured, not so much by the position that one has reached in life as by the obstacle which he has overcome. And that comes from one of my 
Um, one of my favorite authors, Booker T. Washington, very, very wise man. His autobiography, Up From Slavery, is my favorite book. So um, thank you all for joining. Going to make this uh, recording available to everyone. Everybody have a safe, fun week. Bye, guys. Thank you, thank thank you very you. much, guys. Uh, best way to reach me is on email. I left it on the messenger there. Definitely add me on LinkedIn. I just honestly, I, I try to catch up with my email unreads first before I go on other ones. So I dropped it on there. If you guys have any questions, if you guys want mentoring, if you guys have a venture or something that you need help with, I don't mind doing a little bit of pro bono. Or if you just want to hop on a call and just chat, get to know me and just ask me random questions, um, like what you read on the bio, you want to learn what I cook about or stuff. That's cool. I'm fine. <laughs> thank you very much. And I thank you. Thank you for the platform really amazing. I think this is a great community for everyone to learn and actually advance very, very well. So I just encourage you guys to use it, use it. You get as much as you put in. That's, I mean, that's true for everything. And Lavode has really created an amazing ecosystem here. So I mean, just a thousand percent props. Thank you for inviting me to the tent. Thank you for your advice. It was really helpful. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Bye guys. Have a great weekend. Thanks, David. Thanks guys. Bye. Have a good one.